Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. If you can hear me, maybe give me a thumbs up. Awesome. I uh, hope you guys are doing well this afternoon. On behalf of New England's MHTTC's Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative, I'm excited to welcome all of you to the fifth of our series of online discussions on implementing real-world evidence-based services for early psychosis and clinical high risk. Today's discussion, I'm very excited about, is about a really innovative decision support tool for payment design for coordinated specialty care. And we have some excellent guest speakers today, Dr. Bao and Dr. Dixon. Um, as you guys are signing in, please take a moment, if you haven't yet, to introduce yourselves in the chat, one of the things I've really enjoyed about the series so far is an opportunity to connect not only with our expert speakers, but also to learn from all the expertise of all of you who are attending. So please chat in your ideas, share where you're coming from, any questions that you have you really hope we're gonna answer today. Please um, don't hesitate to write those in. My name is Michelle Friedman Yakubiev, and I'm calling in from my home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The uh, state is starting to open up slowly in different ways, but still trying to figure out what that means for us. And uh, I think most of us are still uh, conducting just about all of our services remotely at this point. The goal of this online series is to bring together leaders, clinicians, administrators, and other stakeholders who are interested in working together to increase the feasibility and scalability of specialized early psychosis and clinical high risk for psychosis treatment. The format of each discussion in the series is a 30 minute presentation by invited experts, followed by 30 minutes of discussion. So we really hope that you'll choose to keep your cameras on today. Thanks for those who I get to see. It's really nice to be able to see some faces when I'm talking. And I know it's nice for our presenters as well. And we really hope you'll actively participate in the discussion. We also hope that some of you will use these discussions as a chance to network and develop some working groups to try out some of the strategies that are discussed and the important initiatives that will make quality coordinated specialty care accessible to all the young people and families that need it. So now my colleague, Rachel, is gonna share with you some housekeeping information and just some general information about the MHTTC. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Hi, everyone. This is Rachel, the project coordinator for our Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative. I just wanted to review a few housekeeping items with you all before we begin. Participant microphones will be muted at entry, and you'll be able to unmute them during the discussion portion. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the topic, please use the chat or the raise hand feature during the discussion to have your microphone unmuted. This discussion is also being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on the MHTTC website. And to reach us after the webinar, you can email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. And then on the next slide, um, our MHTTC's mission is to use the evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based practices across New England. Our area of focus is geared towards recovery through recovery-oriented practices and support services within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care. Next slide, please. And to ensure the responsiveness of our work, we will actively develop and maintain a network composed of different stakeholders from each of the six states to guide our activities. And with that, it is my pleasure to hand it back over to Dr. Michelle Friedman-Yakubian for introductions. Thank you, Rachel. So we have two terrific presenters today who will be leading a discussion about their innovative decision support tool for payment design for coordinated specialty care. This is a really nice follow-up to our previous discussions about finding ways to support coordinated specialty care services that include important services that are often not covered by traditional insurance. And I know that this is really timely as there's a lot of economic uncertainty around the country and folks are wondering how grant support for programs may be affected 
as well. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bao and Dr. Dixon. Dr. Bao, Yuhua Bao, is a health economist and associate professor at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. Dr. Bao's research is concerned with economic and policy strategies to support evidence-based care for mental health and substance use conditions. A current area of interest is payment innovations for early psychosis. Dr. Bao is leading a project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to develop a decision support tool to assist payers and providers of early psychosis programs in payment design. And we also have Dr. Lisa Dixon, who is the Edna L. Edison Professor of Psychiatry of the New York State Psychiatric Institute, Columbia University, Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons, and New York Presbyterian, and the Director of the Division of Behavioral Health Services and Policy Research in the Center for Practice Innovations. So welcome, Dr. Bao and Dr. Dixon. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share our work, and we really look forward to uh, uh, you know, hearing you know, your feedback. Um, and this is absolutely the relevant community uh, to, to uh, discuss uh, ways. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to start out by acknowledging our funder, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Assistance for Action Program, and the Entrap New York uh, program, which is a New York State implementation of CSC, is supported by the New York State Office of Middle House. Uh, and in addition to our excellent team, uh, you know, I have listed a few individuals here who have contributed to the conceptualization and development of the tool. Uh, thank you. And last but not least, uh, we really appreciate the input by many participants in our stakeholder engagement sessions. Uh, that we've been conducting. Um, so thank you for uh, really helping us check our assumptions, uh, but also providing uh, you know, insights and uh, feedback on the, the tool in development, uh, which uh, and, and I, I think that some of you are actually in the audience today uh, at the discussion, so I really look forward to interacting with you further on this. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is our very multidisciplinary and excellent team, and uh, we have uh, colleagues uh, from uh, New York State uh, Psych Institute and Office of Mental House uh, on the top row, and also my colleagues from White Cornell Medicine, Hunter College, and Mount Sinai uh, at the at the bottom row. Uh, I just I really wanted to highlight uh, uh, Dr. Yan Li, uh, with, who is a system engineer at uh, Mount Sinai, uh, who has been doing the weightlifting of, uh, you know, programming for the for the tool, who you know, which has brought the tool to life, uh, which uh, we are very excited to demonstrate today. Uh, next slide, please. So, why does people service not work for CSC? Uh, so, we know that existing mechanisms typically do not cover. Uh, SEE, peer services, team supervision and meetings, community outreach and engagement. These are all essential and integral parts and components of CSC. And also, uh, people service uh, existing mechanisms rarely cover case management or care coordination. Uh, also, we know that uh, with people service comes a strong incentive for the so called productivity uh, that is, you know, you have to hit our a target of uh, you know x number of patients that you need to see in a day and that is uh, as you all know at, at great odds uh, with the intense service needs uh, for CSC and uh, in addition people service discourages uh, innovation and client centered care um, and it encourages uh, clients and families to pick and choose this is something that we heard uh, repeatedly from uh, you know, uh, provider stakeholders that we engaged, uh, thus dampening fidelity to the model. And uh, all, you know, finally, uh, people service billing, uh, as many of us know, uh, if, if you are engaged in insurance billing, consumes enormous amount of staff time uh, with very low capture rate, uh, meaning that, uh, well, one uh, stakeholder that we spoke with told us that even though they estimate that, okay, insurance billing can cover, say, 
up to 40% of their operating costs. In the end, with all the rejections and resubmissions, they were probably only going to be able to uh, kind of recover 10% uh, of the operating costs. Uh, next slide, please. So with all this background, we know that there is an emerging consensus um, that we need payment innovation, and in particular, we need uh, you know, a, a bundled case rate uh, might be the way to go. Next slide. So, uh, you know, as Michelle mentioned, there was uh, quite some discussion about, you know, a, a bundled payment rate, and uh, Melissa Rowan and, and colleagues have, uh, in the previous uh, discussion, uh, spoke about their effort in identifying a code for uh, such a, a bundled payment for CSC. So why do we need a tool uh, in this case? Um, so there are at least three questions that, uh, had motivated our thinking, our initial thinking about developing a tool. The first one is uh, how much should the case rate be? How do we know what the right case rate payment should be? Um, so given how varied uh, you know, CSE implementation has been uh, around the country, in terms of the specific model that was adopted and then in terms of uh, you know, the makeup of the team, uh, what kind of providers are on the team, and the costs of staffing the team and, and operating, running the program, all varied tremendously uh, across teams. Uh, that's actually what, you know, what we heard by talking to uh, like 14, uh, I mean, sorry, 19 teams around the country. So clearly one size fits all does not quite work here. And the second question is, uh, you know, when we say it's a bundle payment, uh, the, net, the next natural question is what kind of services get bundled into that payment? And we thought that there is this desire to, uh, you know, it would be great to offer decision makers this flexibility in determining what service components get bundled. Um, and so that's the second question. And the third question was, uh, you know, could we build in accountability for client outcomes uh, in this era of, you know, outcome-based, you know, uh, value-based payment? There is always this this desire to uh, at least have an option of building in incentives for uh, achieving desired, uh, you know, outcomes for the clients, and that's also very consistent with the recovery orientation and and the uh, recovery goals of CSC. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so all these have, you know, contributed to our initial thought of, you know, could we develop a tool to assist with local local decision making? Um, because all these, the questions I listed on the left, are uh, by nature a local local questions. Um, next slide, please. And so here is a brief chronology of how the, the idea turned. You know, you know, we turned the idea into now a real tool. And uh, so our, you know, back in 2017, we got awarded a one-year pilot from the other J uh, System for Action program to develop a prototype of the tool. Uh, at that time, it was not interactive. It was not real. Uh, uh, but we brought that prototype to payer stakeholders and namely uh, you know, behavioral health executives from um, managed care plans, uh, Medicaid managed care plans in New York State. And uh, even though it was really an idea that we presented, at that time we were told by these payer stakeholders that we need to involve providers in this process uh, because this is going to be an iterative and collaborative process. And this led to phase two of our project. Uh, we very you know, thankfully, we got uh, funded for another two-year project uh, from uh, the same uh, RWGA program to continue our work in 19, 2019. And uh, we, right, you know, right after that, we uh, started our CSE provider engagement uh, from summer 2019 to winter 2020. We spoke with a total number of 19 CSE teams uh, from coming from 14 states. And uh, in that process, we really, you know, uh, we collected 
qualitative data from the teams on their current funding situations and what their preferred and ideal payment mechanisms might look like. But at the same time, we also uh, we leverage these uh, conversations to also show them a, pro the pro a tool pro prototype to get their feedback so that we can iteratively refine the tool uh, along the way. So now this brings us to uh, 2020, and we are now uh, ready to uh, test uh, the uh, and real and interactive tool uh, with our stakeholder uh, communities, and specifically by engaging payers and providers at the same time. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to briefly you know, go through what the tool does not do. Um, and uh, hopefully my de our demo will show you what it can do. <laughs> and uh, so it does not define conditions for payment. Uh, if you recall uh, the uh, Meadows Institute work, their white paper really uh, had quite some discussion about the conditions for payment, including you know, a CSE provider, you know, program certification, uh, client eligibility criteria, client engagement criteria, uh, ongoing fidelity and quality assurance, uh, client discharge criteria. So uh, the tool that we developed does not define uh, those uh, conditions. Uh, it also does not prescribe CSE team makeup. Uh, we believe that this has to be left to the discussion of key stakeholders at the local level uh, to determine what their uh, team should look like and what FTEs they staff on the team. And uh, the tool currently is focused on CSC for if we, uh, for first step psychosis, but from our discussion and from our uh, development work, uh, we think that it has potential uh, to be uh, to also support payment decision making in the future uh, for, for example, for different phases of uh, psychosis early interventions. Uh, for example, for people with clinically high risk for developing psychosis, but also for you know, when people graduate from the program, there may, there may be a need for a step down phase. Uh, so uh, I, I believe that the principles underlying the tool would uh, also apply here. All right, next slide. Okay, so uh, I would just uh, ask you if everybody is ready, uh, we'll, uh, you know, uh, just buckle up and, and we will go right into the demo. Uh, and Adrian, if I could share my screen. All right, so our tool is, uh, is powered by a software uh, called any logic um, and then I'll just go through this real quick because we have limited time but uh, hopefully that gives you a sense and I'll also have a like a pre-specified scenario of, of a user-defined uh, scenario for the for the payment design okay Um, so this screen really outlines what the tool does, and specifically, it helps the user design a flexible payment system that complements existing payment mechanisms, reflects the staffing and labor costs of local CSE teams, and allows an outcome-based payment component. What it does, it will invite you to make design choices and then show a report of estimated payouts. And here's the, uh, our uh, you know, uh, paper that's under review that outlines the conceptual model, analytical approaches, and data sources. And this string uh, defines four categories of CSE services. Uh, and I'll just let folks read through it maybe for 10 seconds and we'll move on. Um, so what it does is uh, def you know, put CSE services in these four buckets so that, uh, you know, that allows flexibility in determining what services got bundled into the payment. Okay. 
Okay, if uh, uh, you're ready, we'll move on to the second, next uh, screen. Um, so this screen kind of gives the user a warning of what kind of information, uh, and in particular local information, that they would like to be ready with uh, when, we, when they uh, tailor design the tool. And now this screen uh, outlines the two components of the payment design. Uh, so the first part is the case repayment or the bundled case repayment, uh, which covers all or selected types of CSC services, uh, usually paid on per member per month basis. And this is the bulk and, and the, the must have component of the payment system. Um, and the second part is an optional outcome based payment, uh, which uh, are incentive payments paid for each client that achieves a pre-specified outcome over periods of time, for example, three months. Um, so let's get started. And so this is the first choice that user needs to make uh, about, uh, you know, they're asked to select the types of services that you want to cover with the case rate payment. Uh, so if you, no longer remember the definitions. Here is a button you could click to uh, bring up the definitions. Um, and then obviously you can close that up. And for example, in this case, uh, this user uh, wanted to have a very comprehensive uh, payment and, and therefore they checked all four boxes. some lag in the uh, response. Um, okay, so uh, now, uh, so uh, we ask you to provide information pertaining to your local CSC teams, including the credentials of the uh, members, FTEs, and local hourly wage rate. Uh, if you don't have the information at this time, we provide default information based on your state experience. But from our uh, conversation with provider stakeholders, most likely they will have the information and they wanted to uh, use their local information. Okay, so then it brings up the screen where you could pick and choose what kind of personnel are on your team and then their FT and their wage rates. So kind of just bear with me a little bit uh, for my uh, demo here. Uh, so for example, I have in front of me a scenario of a very large CSE team. Uh, so they have uh, they have one FTE of of a licensed uh, master social worker uh, with a wage rate of twenty one, and then they have, you know, for clinical social workers, they again I said it's a very large team. They actually have six full time clinical social workers with an average uh, wage rate of 26. And then uh, they have psychiatrists at 1.25 uh, FTE at a wage rate of 112. And then they have an RN, a full-time RN um, at a wage rate of 34. And they have, uh, they provide peer services, so they have certified peer specialist, uh, which is a full-time equivalent and with a uh, wage rate of 20. Um, and then they also have an SEE specialist with a wage rate of uh, 24 and in addition uh, this team also uh, has you know staff and occupational therapist and they have this is a large team so they have uh, one FTE 
and there's an age rate of 39. And in addition, they also have a data specialist. This data specialist works for a 0.5 of PE at a wage rate of 16. Okay. All right, so uh, then we will we'll ask you some additional information about the costs of staffing your team, including fringe benefit rate, indirect cost rate, and CSE team caseload. And if you do not have such information, you may select a ballpark estimate from a list. Uh, so say in this case, uh, I, I have the information I want, wanted to provide my local fringe benefit rate. Example, it's 40%. And I wanted to provide my uh, indirect cost rate, which is 30% in this case. And also, I know how big my caseload is. Uh, as I said, this is a very big, very large team. Okay, um, so now we move into the second part, which is the optional outcome based payment. And the payment rewards the CAC team for every client that achieves a specified outcome over three months period. It is financed by withholding a proportion of the case rate payment. And you may decide what outcomes to incentivize and how much of the case rate would be at stake uh, or to be allocated to this component. Um, and the CSC teams will be paid a slightly higher case rate payment if an outcome-based payment is included. In other words, if they are held accountable, they're being compensated uh, uh, with a higher case rate payment. Uh, so, for example, we wanted to consider this component, then you, you're now presented with two choices. One is uh, the outcomes that you wanted to be held accountable, and in this case, we uh, select no hospitalization or emergency department visit for behavioral health concerns. And, uh, and then the second choice that you need to make is how much is at stake. So, for example, I only wanted to you know, hold 5% of the total payment at stake. Um, okay, so now we have completed all sections and congratulations. And uh, you can click generate report uh, to see your design summary, uh, which is on the left. Uh, so you can see here it lists out your choices, the data you've input, uh, you know, uh, regarding the makeup of the team and the, co you know, kind of the, all the uh, costs of uh, operating team and your selection about the outcome-based payment. And on the right, it shows an estimated uh, per member per month payment and also uh, an estimated total for uh, 12 months. So in this case, you see that with this design and with this very large team, you'll be paid $1,400 a month uh, for each client engaged in the program. And uh, and you know about you'll be paid close to uh, or a little bit more than nineteen thousand dollars over twelve months for the outcome based payment payment, uh, which comes to a twelve months total of one point about one point seven million uh, dollars. Um, okay, as you can see here, the, here are the added buttons. Uh, you know, are things that you could click on to go back to the you know screen where you input those. Uh, uh, parameters and, and making those choices uh, to start all over again with another scenario of your choice. All right, um, so this, this is the end of uh, my uh, demo and hopefully that's helpful to all of you. And I wanted to uh, you know, have uh, Dr. Uh, Lisa Dixon uh, say a few words about her uh, reflection on the kind of the involvement of the project and the tool and how she sees the uh, kind of the um, you know, utility of this this tool uh, in CSE implementation. 
Hi, hi everybody. Um, thanks so much, Yuha, for your presentation. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't actually have that much to add because I think the presentation makes very clear how, um, how different, um, you know, in some sense, vendors or agencies or programs or states um, could use this tool. Uh, and I really like the fact that it allows um, each program to sort of customize its staffing pattern. And, and you know, so you have different staffing, you have different salaries, um, and, and so you, you can really make it fit um, your situation and, um, and also test out different options. Well, what if this, what if that, you know, could I, what if I have to get it cheaper? Um, and, um, uh, or, I mean, that, I, I can't imagine we'd be looking to make it more expensive, but um, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's really easy to use. Um, and I think, I think it, it reflects uh, the, the, um, the dialogue that, that the team has had with stakeholders. Cause I know in my, in my um, sort of discussions with people across the country, there really is this diversity and you can sort of see the foundation of different, of different uh, costs. I think the, the, the thing that I do think is maybe a little bit less clear um, and, and, you know, probably if, if we uh, had more time to discuss, it's, it's the, um, is the incentive payment and, um, uh, you know, or the, the uh, rewarding, uh, quote unquote, good outcomes. I, I, I think in principle, it's, it's a really um, uh, nice thing, to, feature to have, but I, I just get very nervous um, about these kinds of arrangements just because, not, it's not the tool, it's just the arrangement because I worry about about um, uh, concerns about case mix adjustment and things like that, because you know it, these programs are serve can serve very very different populations in different communities, and, it, and, it, and it's 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 a problem not just with applying this kind of value approach in, in CSC, but but elsewhere. It just has to be done super carefully, and I think that's the one one aspect that I think we're um, looking at a little bit uh, and how to use it. You know, would be would would, would be uh, good to reflect upon and it'll be interesting in our in the stakeholders uh, it, when we have more stakeholders play with the tool to see how they use that incentive uh, payment uh, uh, aspect to it so um, I have to say like I was a little skeptical at first and I'm like whoa <laughs> this this is really this could be really useful so thanks you I think we're ready for questions right thank you Awesome. Thanks so much. I, I always think it is just so incredibly cool to get different perspectives on this issue. You know, we, we can all recognize that coordinated specialty care has aspects that are not paid for currently that rely, you know, very much in my work in the Cedar Clinic and in first episode programs in Massachusetts. We rely year to year on grants to keep things running and supported. And I had the pleasure of being one of the research participants in trying out these tools. And it's so interesting to me how some of the things that I, as a clinician, would likely get bogged down with, like what are the services we're providing? How much is the, are those services worth? What's the fair rate for every single service that we offer in the clinic? How those things are not needed for this tool. The tool is based on how do you make this program run? And what do you need to keep that going? And I think that's really, really neat. So I wanna give folks a chance. There's already some very interesting questions that have popped up in the chat. So maybe I'll read through some and give folks a chance to also, anyone who's brave and is willing to put their cameras on and speak, to also ask questions, so feel free to jump in. Okay. As folks are not jumping in all at once just yet, um, Margaret Geyer uh, wrote in, this looks great, thanks for pulling this together. One additional task we have is administration of assessment instruments that assist with the treatment planning and ongoing evaluation of treatment progress and outcomes. So that's just maybe another piece that can go into uh, in our teams, the uh, administrative piece, potentially. 
there's a question about employer engagement for supported employment and education uh, teams. Any thoughts on, would that go into administration as well? You yeah, want to, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, I would say that if, uh, since this is not going to be fee for service, this, you know, this, the idea is to move away from fee for service. Mm -hmm. So the SE, whatever S, the uh, uh, supporting employment education specialist needs to do um, to help the client uh, is included under SEE and peer special uh, services. That makes sense. And then I would just follow it up with say to help the clients. In other words, some of the supported employment and education activities are not necessarily tagged to a particular participant. But mm -hmm. for, and so you don't need, it doesn't need to be tagged to a specific participant, but it would, it would be included in the overall cost at that time. Right, absolutely. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. And Michelle West had a great question. Um, is there a comparison to the cost of a month in the hospital? So you came up with a figure that was about $1,400 for a uh, coordinated specialty care case rate uh, for that team. Does anyone know how that compares to hospital rates? I'm sure it's pretty good compared to that, I would think. You say hopefully the hospital is higher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess that that needs to be based on the uh, evidence on like uh, how does uh, you know access to CSC services uh, how is that associated with reduced hospitalization mm -hmm. and then uh, we can cost that reduction in hospitalization out right uh, we we estimate a cost of those reduced hospitalization and compare to uh, the uh, monthly cost of uh, paying for CSC. That's definitely doable if we have rigorous evidence on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the question, I mean, the question can be answered without necessarily um, uh, uh, asserting that CSC reduces hospitalization. I, I think, you know, I mean, it, it, it would be nice if it did, and there's some evidence that it does, but again, I, these are things that get me nervous because we want to have appropriate care, not and sometimes people need hospitalization. So, I mean, I, I think I think that that the the question of cost effectiveness is is sort of a separate one to some extent for for this, right? From this, um, and what the how it, you know how the overall costs are of the of the individual are are affected. But again, we always have to remember too that sometimes the payer may be different when it's hospital versus the outpatient can be, you know outpatient setting, and, and so it gets very complicated very quickly. And I think I was one of the participants in the early kind of phase two. And I think that was um, one of, I think you're making that point, Lisa, that it, one of my hesitations was if incentivizing no hospitalization, do people, are they thinking that when they're making clinical decisions? Is it lodged somewhere? And, and I would worry about that. But um, like other things like work and school and, um, uh, you know, those are things that are certainly all targets if, if that's a self-identified area for a young person um, that we're working towards. So, Yeah, I mean, in some sense, the tool is agnostic. The tool is just a tool. Right. <laughs> we have to decide how we want to use it, right, and, and what the risks are of using these different features, not just of the tool, but also, you know, of, of how we organize this care. Yeah, well, th thank you, Kathy, for uh, that comment and, and for, you know, contributing to our tool development uh, yeah so that comment is is, is is one that we heard you know constantly from our uh, stakeholders uh, kind of the concern that this perverse incentive associated with uh, you know a measure or an outcome measure of reduced hospitalization right uh, and so you know you don't want to hold clients back from hospitalizations that they actually need. Um, mm -hmm. So, but as Lisa, I, I agree with Lisa that uh, this is a general issue, uh, you know, attached to 
a better base of payment, if you will. Um, and, uh, and associated with comms, uh, you know, all the case, case mix adjustment and, you know, how do we know that the providers are not being uh, adversely penalized, uh, you know, just because their clients are, uh, you know, have more challenges or, or more serious conditions to, to begin with. Um, yes, uh, so this tool does not address that. And I think that, again, it's, it's among the stakeholders, uh, it's up to the stakeholders to, uh, you know, come up with strategies to counter, counteract that kind of uh, perverse incentive. I'm A couple curious. people wrote in are curious. Go ahead. Oh, I'm Thanks sorry. I don't mean to be blur blurting in. There's a whole host of costs which are not directly attributable to individual patients or clients that every program needs to take on, particularly at the outset. So there'd be a difference between more mature uh, programs and, and, more, and new ones. Things like educating the community that early psychosis is actually treatable and should not be uh, approached with benign neglect. Uh, you know, uh, the making encouraging greater efforts to uh, in, refer and engage, uh, training up a team in evidence-based practices. Uh, and so we've chosen to use cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis. So there's a training process with costs involved with that, uh, and so on. Um, the issue of time, uh, you know, we, with you know, get, acquiring data so that you can assess how you're doing, or getting uh, functional outcome assessments and so on. Um, we, uh, some programs, and part of what, what we're thinking of here in Maine is to essentially, and, and this is controversial, not to fold that into the per member per month cost, but to try to find some other funding for that. And we're in Maine. We're look. Fortunately, the state is to use the um, um, mental health block grant uh, to uh, support that and try to look for other funding. So I'm interested in, and, and I've heard of different different ways to go about uh, dealing with that area of cost. I I suspected when we see kind of pretty wide variations in in costs from program to program that whether they do or do not include this may be part of why we see variation in costs. So I'm interested in your in your perspective as you've looked around the country, uh, you, you and, and Lisa, uh, what what you're seeing in how to approach this cost. Go ahead, Yuha. Oh, mm. <laughs> uh, I I'll, I'll speak from the 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 payment systems point of view, uh, which is, uh, so our goal here is to design a case rate a per member per month payment that covers the operating costs, ongoing operating costs of running the team, uh, because it has to be tied, you know, when it comes to a bundled payment, uh, it has to be tied to a, a insured client, mm -hmm. uh, if you think about it. Uh, so. Uh, it's true that the uh, I you know uh, I, I did not make it explicit uh, that uh, the the start up costs you know which is very intensive and um, and expensive right uh, why you you have very few clients uh, you're just starting up and you it, that you know you need pretty intensive investment to uh, have the team up and running and recruit and train and supervise and do all the uh, you know, initial uh, community outreach and, and, and engagement, right? Uh, so these are not in, in, implicitly, these are not covered. The startup uh, initial uh, costs are not covered, are not intended uh, to be covered by those, uh, uh, you know, per member per month rate. Um, so what we've, uh, from our discussion with stakeholders around the country, I think they pretty much used uh, mental health block grant funding and other state funding um, to, uh, you know, uh, to help them with the initial stage. Um, so, uh, but if it's ongoing, I mean, while, while the, even for a very established team, you still have to incur a big amount, a big proportion of your total operating costs go to these uh, you know activities team supervision meetings uh, um, you know community outreach 
and even you know before a client gets enrolled into the program there are a big chunk of costs and like engaging the client and the families and in doing assessment and determining eligibility uh, so all these are supposed to be covered uh, under this uh, per member per month rate uh, because we have costed uh, based on the, the you know the costs of uh, operating a team um, so I'll just stop here and see if Lisa has any. Uh, yeah, no, that's, I mean, you said exactly what I, you know, the, you, there's the, certainly the administrative costs are a place to, to park um, some of those additional costs. Um, but, you know, I, I, um, I, I mean, I, look, you know, there, there are advantages and disadvantages to really just focusing on the client level you know, appointments that they have, you know, even to use a bundled rate for, for, for just the, the, the client level um, uh, costs. I, I just worry myself that if we start separating out, as, as if we can separate out the client costs from the overall costs, I mean, outreach, engagement, um, uh, uh, learning healthcare system kind of data management and, and quality improvement, I, I think is an essential part of the program. So, um, you know, I, I can see it both ways, you know, um, trying to, to disaggregate these costs, but I think this, this the, the startup costs, I agree with you, are completely, it's, it's really a different situation because um, you're not in equilibrium, you have a very small caseload. But I get it, from what I've seen, this startup pays is getting shorter and shorter, <laughs> you know, uh, out there. Um, but I, I think I think the model is is generally built to accommodate both the patient level and then the the overall costs. There are some great great questions in the chat. Some of them have to do with negotiating with different payers, experience with maybe using this tool directly with insurance companies, or to use it as a way of of managing funding for a program. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that that is actually the idea. I'm, I'm glad that people see it uh, without kind of I mm -hmm. explicitly saying that it. Uh, so uh, this is again, this uh, the tool is not to dictate uh, your payment design or how much you will get paid. Um, so. This is a decision support tool, so the, the objective here is really to assist with or facilitate discussion and negotiation between payers and providers. And, uh, and a secondary uh, kind of objective is to provide transparency uh, in this negotiation process, in this discussion process. Because, you know, we've heard from uh, quite a number of provider stakeholders that uh, oftentimes they're pre being pretty passive and uh, kind of accepting what gets paid to them. Um, so uh, you know the, what 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 what's determined in the uh, you know payment design process is not transparent. Uh, you know how is it determined? Is that enough? Is that sufficient uh, to support the operation of an evidence-based model? Um, so this, the tool really, you know, uh, the idea is really to bring providers and payers together uh, and, uh, you know, with transparency of the input and the kind of the uh, analytical kind of uh, procedures that uh, lead us to an estimate of, of payment uh, rates, but also like allow the stakeholders to, uh, you know, uh, conduct what if. Uh, analyses, if, if you will. Um, so, yeah. kind of, you know, if, if I wanted, you know, it's, as Lisa said, if, if you think this is too expensive, it's something that you cannot live up with. Uh, so, what about we tweak this parameter a bit? Uh, can mm -hmm. we live as a provider team, uh, instead of uh, six uh, clinical, uh, you know, social workers, maybe, can we live with like 5.5 uh, social workers and still be able to provide like uh, high quality care. So kind of that kind of discussion. Yuhua, can I ask you a question? So just to follow up on Doug's comment, can you use this tool just to focus on the, the patient level costs? So if you just wipe out all the administrative costs and all the, the, uh, the kind of non-patient level costs, can, you, can, can the tool do that? 
Absolutely. So that's what the first choice is for. Right. Uh, so remember the four categories, uh, clinical, mm -hmm. uh, SEE and peer services, uh, case management or care management. And the last categories right. are administrative and operational costs. And these are the bulk of these services are not tied to a specific right. client, um, but yet essential for the operation of the, of the program. Uh, but if, if the stakeholder decide that this bundled payment is not going to cover that part of the cost, they can uncheck that box yep. and see what the payment rate will mm -hmm. come out to be. Yep. Yep. Have you guys had experience in talking with insurance companies directly about this and trying to use it? Yeah, as I mentioned, initially we actually uh, took the protocol, uh, you know, prototype uh, to insurance, uh, you know, executives uh, in Medicaid and care plans. Uh, they thought mm -hmm. it kind of cool, uh, but they, uh, you know, I guess a year ago, a year and a year and a half ago, it's still not, I mean, the payers don't, did not feel imperative to to jump into this unless uh, you know there's some kind of pressure for them to do so, right? Either from the state, uh, or you know there is a legislation that's been passed uh, that asking for access to, uh, you know, uh, requiring access to these services and therefore insurance coverage. So I really applaud uh, the, the efforts that I've I'm aware of <laughs> that uh, you know in this community uh, where, uh, you know, provider communities have really uh, kind of uh, been very uh, um, proactive in terms of, uh, you know, going through legislation, but, you know, also kind of working proactively with uh, the public and private payers uh, in that regard. Um, but, uh, and, but on the other hand, I think our uh, user tests uh, next that's coming up uh, that we, in which we hope to engage diets, pairs of uh, providers, payers to, in this process uh, is kind of a test to the idea, an ultimate test to the idea of whether, you know, uh, you know I, I think it has to be, uh, you know, engaging both parties uh, in, in that process. Thank you. So there's some more questions in the chat, including does the tool account for payer mix, including uninsured? It does not. Uh, so uh, again, this is for, uh, uh, I said that it's for local decision making, but it's also uh, specifically to support a dis decision making between one, uh, between a provider team, between a, a CSC you know, program and a specific payer. So again, you know, ultimately this is for, to design a payment mm -hmm. model uh, by a payer. An insured person, uh, you know, unfortunately does not have a payer. But you could imagine, um, you, but you could imagine that, let's say, you know, if you, if you, if you come up with an estimated cost, right, per, per client month, and you know you're not getting that, that, that would then give you a sense of what what your uh, what your loss is and what mm -hmm. you might need exactly to yeah up. so sure. um, so it, it's also you know it, the tool itself does not uh, say where you know like uncompensated care or uh, care for any short people where where could how could that cost be covered uh, it you know, our tool does not tell anything about that but the payment rate that you design and you come up with with payers may serve as a guide for, for example, the state, right, uh, to say, okay, you guys are receiving $1,200 a month for caring for a Medicaid patient. Uh, so maybe for the uncompensated, for the uninsured patients, uh, we can, you know, from the general uh, kind of state mental health funding, maybe we could you know, have a budget uh, made up uh, for you mm -hmm. on a yearly basis. That makes sense. Uh, someone also was asking whether there's public access to this tool, or I think a more general question might be, 
And if somebody wanted to try this out, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so this tool is uh, meant to be, as I said, it was, we were, we're funded by Raw uh, and uh, we are uh, expected to make this tool public uh, when it's fully developed and tested. Uh, and so uh, at some point in the future, we will make a, you know, a fully interactive tool available to the community uh, uh, free of charge. Uh, and uh, whether or not it needs to be further tailored, um, because there are many different ways this tool can be further developed and tailored, uh, is another question, and that that's probably uh, will be done on a case by case basis. But yes, it will be uh, made available, and that's also another reason <laughs> for me to put put out this commercial for uh, you know encouraging folks to uh, reach out to us uh, for. Uh, to participate in the user tests uh, that will help us uh, better, you know, kind of improve this uh, further, but also give you a early access to, to the tool to, to get a sense of what it can do. Sounds great. And I think your email address and contact information is included in the slides. Is that correct? Yes. We'll be, we'll be um, posting that on our website, and that'll be a recording of this whole presentation will be sent out to registrants and will be available on our website as well within a, within yeah, a few I'll, days. Uh, I'll type it into, my, into the chat box right now. Awesome. Great. We probably have time for maybe one more quick question or comment. Or I will say thank you to all of you for participating and thanks so much for your generous time and efforts in this really, this really useful work. I think this is going to be something that, you know, most of us working in early psychosis care don't have a lot of background in business and finance and understanding these things. And so you've really developed something that I think is take something that feels very complicated to many of us and makes it more accessible and useful to be able to figure out what do we what do we do in our program how do we support it and what's needed um, and I think it's going to be an incredibly useful tool for efforts to find ways to make the programs that we offer to be feasible over the long term versus dependent on grants that inevitably run out. You know, I, I actually, just to follow oh, up thank on- Thank you. So, can I just follow up on that for a sec? Um, I, I actually think this, yeah. this kind of a tool is, is useful for way, way more than just coordinated specialty care. Like it, because it really breaks down how to think about a team-based model. And so I, you know, with, with some tweaks and adaptations, it, 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 it teaches us, right? It teaches us on the, who are clinicians, like how to think about costs. And I think it, it, it could easily be adapted um, for a number of other, you know, at, at, at an agency level, you know, where we're building, like we're, we're now, you know, team-based care in some ways is, 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 a, is an ideal um, uh, across the, 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 the spectrum of, of illness and, and age and, so I, I just love, I, I think this, this could really be um, uh, broadened and, 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 it, and it can also be used in, in, in schools. <laughs> I mean, just like, yeah. you know, to, to teach people how to think about, um, you know, costs of a program, because you can play with it in so many different ways um, and, and use it, you know, almost like to, as a learning tool. You know, Very I, I would chime in that it's, it's, a, it's useful in terms of how we think about this term value-based healthcare, which remains more of an abstraction than a reality. And this is a way to start to encom encompass all the different components of treatment. Um, so I, I think you're, that point you're making, Lisa, is very important. Thank you. We are I, really, uh, it has been very, extremely inspiring uh, working with uh, CSE providers uh, in this effort. and. Uh, I really hope that this is going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, so do uh, reach out to us and uh, I, 
I'm sure that our team will reach out to a lot of you uh, in the uh, coming months and years to, uh, you know, uh, hopefully make this more, uh, you know, practical and useful uh, for the very important work uh, that you are doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. So um, that's the end of our program. Blue Shield. So it'll be very interesting hearing from his perspective with an insurance hat on about these issues. So I hope that many of you will return for that one. It's going to be sometime in August. The exact date is TBD and we'll be sending out an announcement soon. So thanks again everybody for your time today and I look forward to seeing and connecting with you in other programs. Take care. <laughs>